Hey there, good morning everybody. It is Sunday, December the 5th. 2021, 8 o'clock in the morning, and we are in the book of Matthew today, chapter number 5. We're starting the Sermon on the Mount. It'll last for three days, uh, not consecutively or continuously, I should say, but uh, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, all of them part of one continual sermon that Jesus is preaching to this multitude of people that have been following him. We've seen step by step the way the ministry of Christ has taken off. He was baptized in chapter 3. Chapter 4, he spends 40 days in the wilderness alone, meeting with God, talking to God, and uh, being tempted of the devil. Then he starts to uh, preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then we see him round up four disciples so far, Peter and Andrew, James and John. And so he's been healing and teaching in the synagogues and preaching, and he's got quite a following at this point. So now he's going to preach to them this long sermon, the longest recorded sermon of Christ in the Gospels, amazing content. There's so much here to unpack. And as I've said before, We're not going to exhaust this. We couldn't possibly. For instance, chapter 5 has 48 verses. If we started working through this thing and teaching it, we would cover uh, hours of of time. So we we don't have time for that. These are meant to be simple daily devotions that we don't generally go too much past 30 minutes on. Generally, 10 to 20 minutes is where we're at. 30 is a long devotion. We've gone over 30 just a couple of times. We'll see what happens here. But uh, Matthew 5, let's pray. Father, help us as we look into the scripture this morning. Help us to comprehend and understand what you have for us. We need you today. We need to hear from you. We ask all of this in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, chapter 5, Matthew, verse number 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we're about to start a series of verses that are all going to start with blessed are. These are known as the Beatitudes. So if you've ever heard that phrase or that term, this is the passage of scripture that it's speaking to. And what Jesus is telling us is all those who are struggling but trying to do right, they're blessed and God will bless them and not to give up. He's giving them hope. Every single person here is given hope. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That way, a poor in spirit person, someone who's discouraged and down, can say, well, praise God, I got something to look forward to. Verse 4, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So he is blessing and praising the people that have been following him, that have been learning from him, that have been helped by him that have been instructed by him. He's saying, look, you folks are on the right track. I know not everything is going well in your life. I know that every one of you has a burden or a problem, a trial you're going through. I know that not every one of you is there. You're all struggling in in some area or another. I understand that, but I want you to know there is hope. No matter what area you're struggling in, Jesus gives these people hope. What a blessing. Verse 13. Now the teaching starts. That was the pat on the back. Now we're going to do some instructing. He's not rebuking here. He's instructing. 
ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. So he tells his followers that they're salt. Salt is distinguishable. Salt, it's noticeable. If you take a bite of food, salt is that thing that jumps right out at you. It's that part, your taste buds, they, it, they know, they, your taste buds know that salt is present. And so he's saying, you are salt, but if you ever lose your savor, you don't have any good. There's, you're good for nothing. You may as well be cast out and be trodden under the foot of men. Salt is pointless if it doesn't have savor. And so he's instructing his people here, don't lose your savor. Don't lose your saltiness. It's your saltiness that is going to be used by God. If you lose your saltiness, you're good for nothing. And I don't mean saltiness. Sometimes we can use that term to mean abrasive or or difficult. I don't mean that. I mean that part of you that stands for right and that does right and lets your light shine, that's going to matter. In fact, that's what's next. Verse 14, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a stick, and it giveth a light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So he gives us two different, no, three different, yeah, two different uh, examples of light here. A city that's on a hill, you can't hide that city. Because the light of that city is going to be seen for miles around. Also, no one lights a candle and puts it under a bushel basket. You light a candle and put it on a candlestick to let the light shine. The purpose of light is to shine. And you don't hide light. And then he applies it. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And so you and I are supposed to be doing good as we go about our day throughout our communities, throughout our families and and social circles. We're to be doing good so that when people see that good being done by us, they glorify our Father which is in heaven. Verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Uh, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So he sets it up right here because he's going to do some things that people are going to take issue with. He's going to allow his disciples to pick corn and eat it on the Sabbath. He's going to heal people on the Sabbath. And he's going to do some things that seem to be breaking the Old Testament law. It's not, but it seems to be to the people. So he warns them ahead of time, I am not come to destroy the law. I'm come to fulfill the law. And Jesus will fulfill the law perfectly in his time on earth. And then he says that not one jot or tittle, and that's the dotting of the I and the crossing of the T, shall in no wise pass till all be fulfilled. Verse 19, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And so he says, I'm not here to teach you to break the the law. I'm here to teach you to uphold the law, to fulfill the law. And he says, anyone who does teach people to break it, they're going to be least in heaven or, or lowest on the totem pole. Uh, whoever teaches people to do it, they'll be greatest in heaven. Verse 20, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So that's going to get the attention of the Pharisees, isn't it? Basically, he just said, Pharisees are on their way to hell. 
Now, let's explain this verse, lest you think you have to work your way to heaven. What he's saying is, Christ is the fulfillment of the law. And when we turn to Christ empty and without our works, and we say, Christ, we do not have what it takes to satisfy the justice of God because of our sin. We turn to you for mercy and forgiveness. Jesus then takes his sin, puts it upon himself, uh, takes your sin rather, puts it upon himself, then he takes his righteousness and gives it to you. So here's a question for you. Do you think that the righteousness of Christ exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees? Absolutely it does. Uh, Our man's righteousness will always fall short of the law and certainly of Christ's righteousness. So our righteousness has to become the righteousness of Christ. When it does, we'll find ourselves a home in heaven. If we fail to take Christ's righteousness upon ourselves, and we, like the Pharisees, try to earn our way to heaven, then we'll not find our way there. Verse 21, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. Now he's going to start breaking down some matters of the law. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. And so he's saying here that truly... The spirit of the law is harsher than the letter of the law. And we're going to see this uh, played out quite a bit throughout the rest of this chapter. So let's go through it again. Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. That's what the law says. Thou shalt not kill. The letter of the law. But I say unto you, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. He says, look, you, the law says kill somebody, you'll be in danger. I say being unjustly angry towards someone, you're in danger. That's a much higher bar than was set by the law, isn't it? It's easy not to kill people. It's hard to not be angry with people even when they don't really deserve it. Sometimes we get that way. We're very selfish. We're very prideful. Then he says that, uh, and whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. That means they're going to have to face the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Uh, So he's, the point that's being made here in this section of scripture is the law, the written law has a much lower expectation of man than the spirit of that law does. Verse 23 Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. So the first thing Jesus is setting out to do is get people loving each other again. There are two great commandments, right? Commandment number one is love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Commandment number two is to love your neighbor as yourself. So here he's saying, you don't kill your your neighbor. <laughs> That's what the law says. Not only that, you don't even be angry with your neighbor without a cause. You don't be, uh, you don't call your neighbor Raka or a fool. That's going to be a problem. And then if you bring a gift to the altar, if you want to give something to God, and you remember there that somebody's angry with you, leave the gift. Don't present it to the Lord yet. Leave the gift. Go make it right with that person who's angry with you. After you've made it right with them, then come back and offer the gift. God says, look, I don't want you trying to butter me up with gifts while you're still running around not getting along with people. One of my two great commandments that all the law hangs on is love your neighbor as yourself. And so you leave your gift, go make it right, and then come and offer. Now he continues this thought of getting along with people. Verse 25, agree with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way with him 
lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. He says, look, if you're not getting along with someone, if you've done somebody wrong, if they have dirt on you or they, they have a reason to be angry with you, then you need to sort it out with them. If you don't sort it out with them, worse things are going to happen. Uh, they're going to turn you in for not paying your debts and they're going to come and arrest you and you won't get out of prison until you've paid that in full. So when the opportunity is available, make it right with your adversary. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Here's another one where the law set the bar here, but the spirit of the law sets it even higher. And one of the things that Christ is trying to accomplish here is to show people you're more sinful than you realize. You are violating the law of God in ways that you don't even know. So you need to really contemplate your standing with God. And so he says, don't just not commit adultery. Stop looking at women and lusting after them. If you do, that's adultery of the heart. Verse 29, and if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body shall be cast into hell. So he says, if your eyes causing you to, to sin against God, pluck it out. If your hands causing you to sin against God, cut it off. Now, Literally, he doesn't want people maiming themselves, but the principle is this. If there's something in your life that's causing you to sin, get rid of it. You know, if you have a circle of friends and anytime you're around them, you do wrong, you need to change your friends. If, if there's a certain place you go and every time you go to that place, you fall into sin, quit going to that place. You know, for some people, the internet is a big problem. Quit getting on the internet. You know, certain sites, block them out. Have someone block them out on your computer and so forth. And so whenever there's anything in your life that's causing you to fail God, then get rid of that thing. Verse 31. Now, we're going to have to break this down. This is a little bit complicated because it's not exactly like we do things here in the United States. It has been said, whosoever shall put away his wife... Let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Now, our engagement and marriage practices are different than the Jewish practices. Okay, so we I think we discussed this maybe in chapter number one. I don't recall. But the way that the Jews approach marriage, two young people are dating and courting, then they decide they want to be married. And so they enter a period of time called the betrothal. We often consider that our engagement. It's not exactly the same thing. Let me explain why. When you become betrothed, you're actually legally married. When you become engaged in our society and culture, you're not legally married yet. It's just a verbal agreement. But for the Jews, it was a legally binding agreement. Now, a young man would propose to a young woman. When she accepted, they would go city hall and get their marriage license. And they were legally married. But they did not move in together. They did not consummate the relationship until later on, they'd have a ceremony and then the consummation. All right. So we don't do that. We have an engagement proposal, acceptance, engagement, but you don't get the marriage license until later on in the engagement. And the marriage license isn't signed until the day of the ceremony. So for Jews, the betrothal became the signing of the license and the legally binding marriage. And then later on, the ceremony and consummation. That entire time, though, they're considered husband and wife. 
for us, the proposal, the acceptance, then the engagement period. These two are not legally husband and wife. They're just an engaged couple with a verbal agreement that's not legally binding. Then, on the day of the ceremony, the license is signed, the ceremony is withheld or is held, and then the consummation typically takes place, all in the same day. Then they're legally married. So, taking that information, we've got to define these terms here. It hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. That's what the law allowed. But here's what Jesus is saying. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. So, what is fornication? Well, fornication is sexual activity outside of the marriage bed. So, uh, fornication is sexual activity outside the marriage bed. Adultery is uh, sexual activity while inside the marriage bed. So, what this is saying is for a Jew, if a young Jewish man is is engaged to a young Jewish woman, betrothed rather, they've, they've had the legally binding agreement, they are legally married, but they haven't consummated the relationship. So if she then decides to have a sexual relationship with someone during that betrothal, she's committed fornication. It's not adultery because they haven't consummated yet. And so because of that, before they actually ever completely become husband and wife, Jesus says, you can still put that person away. So that would be different than our culture and the way we do things. Once you become fully husband and wife, you're supposed to stay married no matter what. I've heard a lot of Christians teach and and some preachers preach, well, if, if your spouse commits adultery, that's grounds for divorce. And that's not what this is saying at all. There are no grounds for divorce once you have signed the marriage certificate, had the ceremony, and consummated the relationship. Now, there are certainly times when, under certain circumstances, a separation, I think, is necessary and called for. And we certainly don't have time to tie up every loose end from this subject here. But, uh, you know, talking about physical abuse, uh, things of that nature, no one is, is expected to live under those circumstances. But when you're talking about divorce, it's a whole other matter. And there are other scriptures that, that talk about divorce in more depth. But I just wanted to explain what this is talking about here. Uh, Jesus is saying, look, no divorce. You know, if, if someone commits fornication before the marriage is consummated, then you can split that up because you're not even completely married yet. But that's why these terms are, are worded the way they are and used. Verse 33, we got to keep moving. We got 15 more verses here. Again, ye have heard that it has been said of them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but thou shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be, yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil." So what he's talking about here in these three verses, four verses, is you, you okay, let's go back to the beginning. <laughs> you have heard of men said by them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, thou shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all. And that, that sums it up for us. So what Jesus is saying here is, you know, in the past, you've actually entered into contractual obligations with people and even with God. And I'm saying to you, you shouldn't have to take it to that extent. People shouldn't need your signature to validate that you'll back up what you say. Let your conversation be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than that cometh of evil. What he's saying is simply this, you should be as good as your word is. If you say you're going to do something, you should do that. If you borrow money, you should pay it back without a contract being involved. 
If you promise someone you're going to help them, you should help them without some sort of contract being involved. You should be a man or a woman of your word. Verse 38, Ye hath heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. So this whole passage here, these four verses, uh, five, <laughs> my math isn't so good today. These five verses are talking about not living for self, predominantly, generally speaking. Okay, so let's break them down, and, and I'll try to uh, review it properly. You've heard them said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Every man for himself. You poke out my eye, I'm poking out your eye. You knock out my tooth, I'm knocking out your tooth. Uh, you know, tit for tat, equal for equal. But I say unto you, resist not evil. He says, you know what? Evil's going to come your way. People are going to do you wrong. Don't live your life looking to defend yourself all the time. I say unto you that ye resist not evil. Whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. So let's talk about this for a minute. My right cheek is right here. I know it doesn't look like that to you because the video sometimes reverses things. My right cheeks. Most people are right-handed. So if I'm facing someone, their right cheek is going to be on my left, correct? Yes, I am correct. Though if I'm right-handed... How do I hit someone on their right cheek? You know, we always talk about someone punching you in the face or slapping you like this. To slap someone on their right cheek with the majority of the world right-handed, you have to do a backhand slap. Well, this is meant for injury. This could even be meant for injury. This is insult. So Jesus, first of all, isn't saying you have to suffer injury at the hands of other people. That's not what he's saying. He is saying, take an insult and don't worry about it. If someone insults you, then, you know, go ahead, insult me on this side too. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. You know, quit keeping score of justices. Boy, that doesn't fly in today's climate, does it? Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. In the time that Jesus was preaching this, Roman soldiers had occupied Israel, and a Roman soldier could come up to a citizen and demand that they carry the pack one mile for the soldier, their backpack, their gear. And no matter what the Jew was doing at the time, they had to stop and they had to carry that soldier's pack for a mile. Jesus says, next time somebody takes you a mile, you go two miles. Go that second mile. See, the first mile is under compulsion. The second mile, you made a choice to carry at that mile. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. This whole passage of five verses here is packed in, getting people, forget about yourself. Stop thinking about you. Stop thinking about whether or not people are insulting you. Quit being offended all the time. If somebody sues you and they want something from you, just give them everything you have because those things don't matter in the long run. If somebody asks you to go a mile, go two miles. Show them that they're not in control of you, that you're in control of you. This is good stuff right here. Verse 43, ye have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Man, he's really ripping it apart here, isn't he? But I say to you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So what do we do with our enemies? There's three things to do. Bless them that curse you. That means say good things about them. Do good to them that hate you. That means do good things for them. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So when you have an enemy, you're supposed to do three things. Number one, pray for them. Number two, say nice things about them. And number three, do good things for them. That's what Jesus said. We don't want to do any of those things. If we pray for them, we want to pray that God kills them. We don't want to say good things about them. We want to say bad things about them. And then we don't want to 
uh, we don't want to uh, do nice things for them. We want to do things that harm them. And look at here, verse 45, that ye may be the children of your father, which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. And so here, Jesus tells us, if you're going to be like God, you're going to love your enemies, you're going to do good to those who hate you, you're going to say nice things about those that despise you. And look at here, for if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? He says, look, anybody can be nice to people that are nice to them. I want you to be nice to people who are not nice to you. And then he wraps up the chapter. Uh, well, he didn't, but the <laughs> those who annotated the Bible. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And that word perfect doesn't mean without sin or flaw. We're going to have sins and flaws. It means mature. Mature people can take an insult. Mature people pray for their enemies. Mature people love people that don't necessarily love them because they're not out for themselves. They're out to serve others. All right. That was probably a long one. I don't even know how long it is. Oh, yeah, I do. Ah, 31 minutes there. All right, so I'm going to wrap it up here tomorrow morning. I don't know. We're going to be on the road. That's why I'm not sure. Maybe I'll record this ahead of time and just have it scheduled to play at 10. Maybe we'll do it in the van. We'll just try to uh, have the devotion in the van. We'll see what happens. All right, I'm going to leave you alone with that. Thanks for watching. As always, like, love, and share the post, and we will see you later. Thanks for watching. God bless you. Have a great day.